warm welcome um, on a on a cool night, and uh, thank you for for joining us uh, this evening. A um, couple of things. I think um, most of you are aware that there was um, some youth that were involved in a in a shooting earlier this morning, um, not in our district. I think um, district. Two, I think, um, where there were um, some six middle school um, children. District were, four. District four, thank you. Six, uh, two, um, unfortunately, uh, passed away um, due to the shootings. Four are um, in the hospital. One is, is critical. So um, before we open, I'd just like to, to take a few, just a minute, just um, have some silence as we, you know, continue to come together in this participation to try to work with our um, police officers to help reduce the shootings. But unfortunately, you know, now it's uh, middle age, uh, middle school children um, who are who are involved. So we'll just have a moment of silence to remember the six victims and their and their families. Okay, so thank you. Um, well, this evening um, we will go through our normal uh, um, committee um, members will be presenting, uh, but we also have a guest, a guest speaker, Elaine Towner, uh, with the fire department. She's going to be talking about um, home safety um, during the the winter season, and uh, so we'll go through our our departmental um, presentations, and then at the end of that. Um, Elaine will, will go through her presentation. So Elaine, thank you so much for coming on um, this evening and uh, we look forward to uh, the presentation that you have for us. Thank you so for inviting that, me. Yeah, you're very welcome. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca and she's gonna take us through um, the remaining part of our, our meeting, Rebecca. Thank you, Brian. And I also like to say happy holidays to everyone and also to we just have to continue to keep the great city of Durham, you know, in our prayers with the sadness of the youth. I just want to share, you know, just my heartfelt feelings when you hear something, young people, unfortunately, involved in, in tragedies like that. But um, it's good to see everyone. And we'll start with our monthly department presentations with our police department, we have uh, Commander Robert Gaddy here, and he will share with us what's going on in District 2. It's yours, um, um, Commander. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good evening to everyone, and uh, as always, thank you all for being here and taking the time out to try to make a difference. Uh, District 2, um, we've only, we, we had a homicide. As uh, a matter of fact, I told Nick, I got on the last time we were here, Nick was bragging, said he put it in here that we didn't have any homicides. And probably the day after he said it, that's when we had one. So he jinxed us. But uh, we've had one homicide and that was at 2309 Ledham Street. That was on 11-13-2021. Um, so far this year, year to date, we've had seven in, in the district. Um, we did see a decrease in robberies. There were nine robberies in November versus uh, 14 from October. Um, and you know, as always, we really want to remind you not just just be aware of your surroundings when you're out shopping. Uh, you know, if you're buying bunches of things, bags, and all that, make sure that you um, can uh, put them away in your car, out of sight, out of mind. If you're ordering packages, we've seen some package thefts, and you know, just if you can, if there's a place you can send them where they don't sit on your porch until you get home from work, that would be great. Or if you can, um, you know. A neighbor's house or something like that, somebody that you know is going to be home. Uh, that's one of the suggestions we would make just to prevent people from coming in and trying to uh, take your items that you've ordered for Christmas. Uh, we've seen a decrease in aggravated assaults. We had 16 incidents versus 19 um, in the previous month. Um, 16 incidents were, we actually had 19 victims in the 19 inc incidents. We had 19 incidents with 26 victims, but there's needless to say there's a decrease. 
Uh, burglaries have decreased as well, 36 in November versus 43 in October. Uh, overall, our larcenies have uh, decreased uh, significantly. We were had we only had 174 versus 221 larcenies uh, in October, um, and so the of the um, larcenies that we had of the 174, 82 were from motor vehicles, um, and so about 75 percent of those vehicles were unlocked at the time. And there again, just remember, don't leave valuables in the car. If you have a nice laptop, take it in, bring it to your house, take it in the house with you. Uh, particularly uh, folks that. Uh, like to leave weapons in cars. A lot of times these folks are breaking into cars, looking for guns or whatnot. And so um, they, they will break any car, steal the gun. And unfortunately that's another weapon out in the street. And so just be mindful of that. We are looking at several different operations aimed at quality of life throughout the district. Um, and I think that you all have um, seen an increase, if you hadn't noticed it, of the homeless population uh, on Hillsborough Road, Guest Road, North Point Drive area. We're working with our CIT unit, a crisis intervention unit, to provide different types of uh, relief or shelter for these folks and try to get them out of the situation that they're in. We've had, I think, one or two people that have actually entered into the program and uh, with Officer Beckett, and so it's just a good opportunity for them to get a new lease on life and, and start in a whole new direction. So we will continue to do that. As I talked about package deliveries, as, as I caution you all what to do, we're also doing some things for you. We have officers in marked and unmarked uh, vehicles in your residential areas. So if you see a strange looking vehicle, um, you definitely call 911, uh, but it could be my officers out there just doing surveillance, trying to catch somebody in the act of stealing um, packages. And so uh, we'll hopefully catch some of these folks that are doing that. In terms of uh, if you have any specific quality of life issues that you want to have addressed, please reach out to Lieutenant Cloninger or myself. Um, we can be emailed. Uh, his is nicholas.cloninger. And I, what I'll do, I'll put that in the chat and I'll put mine in there as well. That way, if you have any quality of life issues that you want to look at, want us to address, we're happy to do that. In terms of directed patrols, uh, we, con uh, we conducted 2,135 directed patrols during the month of November, which is a lot. And of course, you you know, you know will always see the increase because of the Christmas holidays. And so that's kind of what's going on in District 2. Um, I think, you know, it's an unfortunate incident that happened in District 4, and my heart goes out to the families as well um, as it relates to that. And um, we'll just keep everybody uh, in, in, in engrossed in prayers. And so I'm looking through the questions. Yeah, I guess with the incident, people are concerned if there's any specific things that you're doing, you know, with the violence and the shooting that you normally just don't do just to keep us safe. Well, you know, and part, part of what I will tell you, and I, and I, I see um, um, friend Captain Webster and Captain Whitaker both up here. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the Sheriff's Department to um, do joint operations as well as our own staff as much as we can between calls for service. Unfortunately, due to our staffing issues in our patrol section particularly, we have not had the opportunity to really get out there and do a lot of proactivity. But um, if we notice things that are going on, I've referred stuff to my gang unit um, and they've been very vigilant. Uh, we've had some issues out in Briar Rose um, outside of town, which is um, out there near Swan's Mill and all that. And so I know that they've been very active in that area as well as Old Oxford Manor. And so as we see areas, uh, we get information that things are picking up, we're um, definitely um, sending that information out there. And it says, are the shootings gang related? Some of them are. And honestly, I would hate to tell you that they all are gang related um, because I don't work that area. And so what I can do, I'm happy to have one of the SOD commanders join us on the next PAC meeting if we need to get some of those questions answered about gangs. Um, it, it, somebody also was asking about, is the homeless um, uptick kind of related to, you know, people being released from hotels on certain areas of town? I, think, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's definitely a, um, 
more of a COVID issue, and not just so much hotels, but just in general, people not working or not receiving the assistance that they once received. And so I think that that's where you see a lot of uptick in it from. I've, you know, I've dealt with people here recently uh, from other areas like Charlotte, from across the different state, Asheville, that we've ran across talking to them as they're out there panhandling. And so um, it's, I think it's, it's more than just the hotels. It's, it's, it's greater spread than just that. Well, Commander, thank Daddy, you. I, I also have a question. Um, what what is the staffing number that is normal for District Two, and what's the shortage? Uh, well, and so you know, we tip on the regular here recently. We've probably been running about fifty-seven to sixty percent, sixty-two percent staffing, and so um, it just um, it varies. You know, it, it could be a number of things. If another district is short then they may pull staffing from district two to supplement that, or if I have people that call out sick or family emergencies. And so it, it kind of fluctuates, but on an average, we're probably running on a 57 to 60%, 62% staffing with just my staff. But now there's also supplemental patrol that comes in. And also sub, uh, we have a uh, slide unit that comes in that boasts that 62% up to the uh, 70, I've seen as high as 77%. So 62, that, that number I gave you is just what my staff is with the vacancies I have. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Captain Gaddy, it has to do with, you know, you hear on the news, you know, over and over and over that, you know, Durham doesn't have enough police officers, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I also know, or at least I've been told um, that our police department does not get paid as the surrounding counties or cities do. Um, we have another new police uh, chief, and I know the previous police chief was very active in trying to raise the salaries for our police officers. And now that city council has been um, voted in, that's done, so that's not gonna change. What is it that um, we as citizens can do to help support the increase in wages so that um, people will want to be police officers in Durham as opposed to driving 10 miles someplace else where they can make more money, which I don't, I don't blame them uh, for that. So um, I just, I would like to support the idea of raising um, wages for the police officer, especially since city council gave themselves a uh, price increase, their own cost increase of $10,000. Um, mm -hmm. So I would like to, uh, I would like to know how we can help make that change and make it happen as quickly as possible. Well, and what, what I would tell you, um, just, just first of all, professionally, I think we, every agency across America has experienced the same thing with the ability, inability to get people to apply for the job and become police officers. And so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not just a, a pay thing per se. Um, however, that does pay into, play into it. Um, and so, what I will tell you that I know for a fact is that the uh, city manager, they've done a, um, a work stu workplace study. And so hopefully they'll be presenting some numbers to the city council that shows where we are in relation to other cities. And so I think that, you know, if anything, um, if you, the biggest thing is to urge your, you know, your ward representative or your, um, even, even, the, even, even the mayor and people like that, that, you know, as citizens urge them to, this is important to us that officers get paid and we don't lose them to that. And I say, if you, so if you, know, if you want to help us, that is usually the biggest thing I would tell you is just talk to your representatives and the people that uh, we as community members have elected to represent us and make sure that they're holding our best interest at heart um, when it comes to things like public safety, when it comes to any type of thing that affects the community as a whole. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, um, if you don't, if we don't have anything right, let me see, do we have anything left in the, um, I guess people were talking about, um, what is it, um, previous shootings? I guess we've sort of addressed it. I mean, um, if you have anything specific that you want to address, we're going to continue on with our departmental briefings, but Captain Gaddy will be here with us. And so he is going and ready to answer any questions, but please just get specific in the chat so we'll know exactly what you're talking about. And we'll make sure that he gets those um, 
at the end of the presentations or during the presentation. All right, let's go to our Sheriff's Department. And I see we have Captain uh, Whitaker. Do we have Captain Webster here? Yes. Yes, Captain Webster, I see you. Um, Captain Webster, um, uh, what's going on with the Sheriff's Department? Let us know. So I'm gonna turn that over to Captain Whitaker tonight. Captain and, uh, Whitaker, let us know. <laughs> all right. Um, how's everybody doing this evening? Hope Good. everybody's doing well. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and happy holidays. Um, for the month of November, the Sheriff's Office Patrol Division responded to 2,393 calls for service. Uh, our residential break-ins outside the, the city limits of Durham did drop um, we, with only uh, 15 break-ins in November. However, um, there were 46 break-ins to motor vehicles, which is slightly higher than the previous month. Um, on five of those break-ins, the type motor vehicles, firearms were stolen. Um, we seized 28 firearms in November, which puts us at 185 seized guns so far this year and recovered two stolen firearms last month and 29 stolen guns have been recovered year to date. Um, 61 traffic accidents were investigated where 32 were uh, property damage only and 29 did result in injuries. Um, we conducted 592 directed patrols, uh, 421 were property related and 171 were directed patrols for traffic. Let's see, uh, a total of uh, 490 traffic stops were conducted of which 80% of those were speeding violations. Um, the civil division uh, received 114 writs of possession, which is uh, residential padlocks um, from landlords and apartment companies. Out of those 114 padlocks, unfortunately, <laughs> only 13 were returned um, to the to the renters being being able to pay their balance or working out something with their landlords. Um, 104, I'm sorry, 101 padlocks were actually conducted in November. Um, and lastly, uh, there were five incidents where people suffering from some kind of cognitive impairment or mental illness were located uh, after being lost or wandering off. All five of those uh, citizens were a part of our, what we call a project lifesaver program. Um, for those that are not familiar with our program, it's a free service we provide that uh, saves lives and reduces potential injuries by quickly locating adults and children who uh, wander due to Alzheimer's, um, autism, dementia, um, or any other related conditions. Um, citizens that are enrolled uh, where they wear a small personal transmitter around either their wrists or their ankles and it emits this tracking signal. If the client goes missing, the, uh, the caregiver notifies us, the sheriff's office, and we have a trained search team that will go and respond to the missing persons uh, to, to their last known area. Um, on average, Project Lifesaver clients uh, are located um, within 30 minutes or so. Um, and that is it from the sheriff's office, unless uh, Captain Webster has anything else that, that he wants to Sure. I just have one other thing. We did a, uh, and Captain Gaddy, I'm, I'm going to steal your thunder here just a little bit. Uh, this past Saturday, Captain Gaddy uh, spearheaded a uh, FOP uh, Cops and Kids event at the Target at the old South Square Mall, where he had pulled together a lot of law enforcement officers to go shopping with kids who are in need. Um, and that made a lot of children's Christmas and um, the faces and um, just the kids themselves had a wonderful time. But I want to publicly thank Captain Gaddy for doing that and putting that uh, that event together. 
Well, thank you, Captain Webster, for highlighting um, our commander out here in District 2. We, we always feel like we have, you know, between the police department and the sheriff's department, we're very fortunate. So um, I'm not surprised you did it. And everyone was involved. So that's a wonderful thing. Congratulations, Captain Getty. Um, oh, well, you. you're welcome for sure. All right, we're gonna continue on. Um, and like I said, make sure that if you have something specific, um, put it in the chat and me hey. or Brian will be, do you have something there? Yeah, there is a Nancy had a- Oh, Nancy, a okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I that's okay. Yeah, she just said that she read the sheriff's department was awarded a grant called the NC Governor's Highway Safety Program. How does that assist the sheriff's office in our county? See another kudos to District Two out here, the sheriffs, and um, in tandem with our wonderful police department. So, you know, we just gotta you know tip our hats to um, the brave law enforcement out here in District Two. So. Kudos to y'all and um, congratulations once again. Um, we're gonna continue on with Parks and Recreation and we have Colleen Toomer, Toomey is, where's Colleen? I don't She's see her. Here. She's here? I'm on, but my, my reception is not working well. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. We can hear you Colleen, so that's good. Okay. All right, so I'm sorry, can't see my shining face. Anyhow, oh. <laughs> um, glad to see everybody out here. We have a good group tonight. That's encouraging. Uh, all right, so quick, we have a holiday parade is coming up this Saturday. Everybody prayers. It's supposed to be 73 and rain right now, so we all have to pray that there's no rain. The 73 would be wonderful. But, you know, rain, no rain would be even better. Um, 11 a.m. straight down Main Street starts at the health department and heads all the way down along the route there. So um, seating will not be provided. So when spectators are encouraged to bring your own chairs and blankets, uh, masks are optional outside. Our parade marshal will be our new mayor, Elaine O'Neill. And then um, the parade MC this time is the WRAL evening anchor, Lena Tillett. Uh, so uh, if anybody is going to be in the parade, thank you. And uh, I know that our uh, Durham police and sheriff, county sheriffs will, will be there, um, but uh, we are looking forward to reinstating our parade once again. Uh, the going into the new year, uh, exciting news that the WD Hill Recreation Center located on Fayetteville Street is has a new look for the new year. If you haven't been by there, uh, you'll see um, that facility renovated both inside and out. And there's going to be a special day on Saturday, January 8th from two to five, recognizing Martin Luther King Day and, a, and an official reopening, uh, official ribbon cutting ceremony. There's also going to be a room dedicated to the Algonquin Tennis Club. This club was originally um, way back when uh, was the original, uh, part of the original uh, founders there at WD Hill. So um, we've got that news. The Weaver Street Recreation Center has had a facelift and um, that grand reopening celebration will be Wednesday, January 19th. Um, so if you have any residents or friends in the Weaver Street um, area, you could plan to attend that. Uh, we have the Dean, uh, Durham Senior Games are coming back again. Registration opens Monday, February 1st. Uh, with the kickoff opening ceremony in April. So we'll continue to talk about that. And we have new engagements coming up for the community after the first of the year. Um, if you haven't been out to the Hoover Road new park property, um, that's exciting to see all the new fields. We have a new playground going in up there. 
and across the street at Wheels, we will begin to have some listening sessions for the community. So watch for announcements if you are interested in uh, providing feedback on the Wheels property. Any questions, comments? All right, well, thank you, Colleen, for all that wonderful information. And the parade, I'm gonna try to get down there, I think. I hope it doesn't rain. Um, we're gonna continue on our departmental presentation. And we have the health department um, is um, Miss Reza on, I, I didn't see, Brian, did you see her? Yes, yeah, she is. Oh, there she is, uh, yeah, there she is. Good to see you, happy holidays. Happy holidays, good to see you all too. And um, Aaliyah is, gonna, is joining me today. She's gonna all go right. ahead and, she's gonna go ahead and take over with the, with the announcements. Thank you so Great. much. All right, go right ahead. No problem, do I have um, the ability to share my screen? Uh, yes, Alexis can. Okay, let me, fingers crossed, it's been a, a technology day for me, so. <laughs> oh, wait, I don't have the rights. Wait a minute. I thought you did. Okay, do I have it now? No, it's still not available. Can someone give me screen sharing capabilities, please? We're going to give you guys a quick update um, about the Omicron variant and then just some health department updates on um, with our new vaccine schedule. Okay. Oh, yeah, Alexa's having screen problems, and unfortunately, she's the host. I'm and, here. Give uh, me one second. Oh, one second. okay. My whole screen just went black, and I could not click on anything. I'm sorry. It must be contagious. It must jump from <laughs> one screen to the next. It's a Monday in December, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead and try now. Okay. looks good and Yvonne you just let me know um yep, it's good looks good okay how about now we can see your notes okay all right Just okay there we go so hello everyone. Um, my name is Aaliyah Brown and I am here with Yvonne Ressa. Um, and Yvonne, feel free to jump in because I can't see any of our notes or anything. So okay. <laughs> feel free to jump in whenever you can. Okay. Uh, so what we know about the Omicron virus um, so how easily does Omicron spread? And Yvonne, if you can share a little bit of information about this, please. Well, let me go ahead and pull it up. All right, so just, um, uh, are you guys able to hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So as far as um, the Omicron, what we know, um, how easily does it spread? So um, the Omicron variant likely will spread more easily than the original SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. And, um, and how easily Omicron spreads compared to Delta remains unknown. Um, the CDC is expected, expects that anyone with Omicron infection can spread the virus to others, even if they are vaccinated or, or don't have symptoms. Uh, what causes a severe illness? Uh, more data is needed to know what the, um, know if the Omicron infections and especially reinfections 
and breakthrough infections in people who are fully vaccinated cause more severe illness or death and infection with other variants. So um, everything is still very new. Um, so they're still trying to go ahead and get all that information. Um, luckily, there's not too many cases. Um, so they're trying to nip it in the bud, but um, it, it, it is spreading. Will vaccines work against the Omicron? Uh, current vaccines are expected to protect against severe illness. Um, hospital hospitalizations and deaths due to infection with the Omicron variant. Um, however, um, like, uh, like with the other variants, breakthrough infections and in people who are fully vaccinated are still likely to occur. Uh, with the other variants like the Delta vaccines have remained the best um, effective um, and preventive measure for severe Ill illness and hospitalizations and death. Um, the the Omicron further emphasizes the importance of vaccinations. Um, so the, the rest of the information Leah will go ahead and uh, cover um, as far as our hours and all that stuff. Yes, and um, the variant has um, found its way to North Carolina. It is not in Durham County as of yet, but the one confirmed case that's in the state is in Mecklenburg County. Um, so an update from the health department from us. So we have Pfizer booster vaccinations are available for um, our youth age 16 and 17 beginning today um, at the health department. Misconceptions, if you've already had COVID-19, you can pass it along to others. You can be reinfected. You do need to be tested. So continue to wear your mask and of course continue to promote vaccinations to others because that is the um, number one recommended precautions against COVID-19 as well as the additional variants. So which vaccines are available here at the health department? We currently offer all brands and doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. So you can get your first, second and all boosters. Um, all vaccines are free for people five and older with no appointment or ID needed. And so our vaccination clinic hours are Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from nine to four, Tuesdays from nine to six, and we are closed for lunch. So be mindful of that when making your plans. Um, so a recent update to our vaccination clinic hours is that we will be offering Friday clinic this week and next week. Um, so it will be this week, I'm sorry. So last week we had it on the 10th and then this Friday, we will have it from nine to 4.30 and that's all doses and brands. And so you can um, walk in or make an appointment. So you can call 560-9217. With holidays coming up, we also have some tips for a healthy holiday season. So of course, I know we're gonna <laughs> beat this down, but get vaccinated or get a booster if you're eligible. Follow all your local and state guidelines, your social distancing, um, take precautions indoors, choose outdoor spaces when possible. I know it's cold, uh, but oddly some kind of, <laughs> we have warm times as well too. So just make some um, conscious decisions and stay at home if you're feeling sick. If you are in need of transportation to some of the vaccine sites, around town, you can call Go Durham at 560-1552, but just make sure you're calling them at least 24 hours in advance. And um, for those whose vaccine card is getting a little flimsy or you probably lost it, you can call the COVID-19 Vaccine Health Center at 888-675-4567, Monday through Friday and on the weekends to receive a replacement. And also they can guide you whenever you went through any retail locations like CVS, Walgreens, and things like that, they can give you the information on how to receive your information from them as well. So we still have COVID testing and that's free, um, available for anyone, regardless of your insurance documentations. Um, you can go through here and um, register for a test or you can also call to get on um, your COVID testing scheduled as well. And so these are some of the testing sites. 
So we have one through El Centro Hispano, some of the local housing authorities as well. So if you need this information, please reach out to us. And of course, if you need transportation to this, they do offer that as well. So here are some of the links to join some of the email listings. Um, and we send out an update every week, even though I know information comes out so fast, but we try to make sure the information is up to date. And you can also um, access information from our COVID-19 data hub as well. And that's all for us. I know it was a lot. No, it really wasn't. It was wonderful because it's <laughs> always good to be reminded. We really do appreciate it because we always were asking Ms. Reza to, you know, continue to give us this information because, it, you know, we're still in it. So yeah. We appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Well, keep us updated. Is anything else? If you have any questions for the health department, once again, put them in the chat and me and Brian will make sure that we'll, we'll get them to there is there is somebody yeah, there is there is one colleen asked what's the average walk-in wait for a booster do you know what the average walk wait time is for, for the booster if you were just walk in i haven't seen any lines at all uh colleen at all um to be honest um it's uh, everybody's going in as soon as they go ahead and check in not even at the check-in um booth they're going in right away so it's still it's still doing pretty good. The first week that uh, we started with the boosters, there was quite a bit, and we're still we're seeing a, um, a frequent, um, a good flow of people, um, but no lines have uh, have yet to be seen yet. So, and um, it's important to go ahead and um, emphasize on for the 16 and 17 year year olds. Um, keep in mind that those boosters are just Pfizer. Um, with the adults, they did go ahead and say that once you got the booster, if you decide to go ahead and get um, any other, um, now that all of them are available, you can go ahead and get it. Uh, with the with the teenagers, um, only the Pfizer up until now has been authorized. And really quick about the weight, um, although you don't need any appointments to come in, if you're worried about the wait time, I haven't seen too much of a wait, but I, you can always call and see. Um, how busy it is prior to you coming but honestly so far i'm seeing the longest time being actually getting into the building yeah so going through the screening process but right. other than that um i think you guys should be good perfect thank you so much well i'll tell you what that was wonderful i thank you ladies for that information we're going to continue on um nis has just re just really supportive of district two um Mr. Span is not here this evening, but we are just really fortunate to have um, Alexis John, if, if there's from NIS, if there's any information she'd like to share, um, I'm gonna give the floor to her. Hello, Ms. John. Thank you, Rebecca. And I will be really quick. I know we're getting close on time. Um, I do wanna thank everyone who came to the community conversations last month. Um, we had over a hundred folks uh, tune in. Um, and definitely more on the YouTube and the Facebook page. If you didn't see that, it is available on both of those. Um, so you can definitely go to community engagement um, team on Facebook and view it there. Um, but that's only the beginning. Uh, we definitely had um, a good conversation there. Folks were able to ask questions. Um, they received information from the community resource unit, the community engagement unit, and um, victim services, uh, the 911 center, um, and there are words from um, Chief Andrews and Sheriff Burkhead. Um, but definitely this is the space to continue those conversations and put actions to those conversations. It's one thing to come and meet and have our questions answered, but it's a whole nother thing to actually put strategy to it and see where we can support um, I did want to um, say thank you to uh, Ms. Nancy Nipkins for asking the question, how do we support you? Like, what can we do to support you? And that's so important when we're asking our questions is um, we're asking them so that we can then take action after the answer is given. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, and so as we go into the new year, 
Um, hopefully when we come to the next meeting, we can continue the conversation that started with that community conversation um, and see what we can do as a pack um, so we can actually put action to our words. Um, and thank you, that's it. Thank you so much, Alexis. Alexis, to, for reminding us how it all we all really are working for together for the greater good of of Durham. Um, so we do have a um, speaker this evening. We're very fortunate to have Elaine Towner here from the Durham Fire Department. And since you know we're during these holidays and people are you know candles and lights, and then we just wanted to give something, uh, just a reminder to everyone how important it is to just be uh, safe. So I'm gonna put the floor to you, Ms. Towner, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca, for um, the invitation. And I've enjoyed hearing what your PAC group and all the department members had to say. Uh, I really thank you for the invitation. It, we are always looking for uh, communities and people in the community that want to know how to keep themselves safer, keep their friends, family, their homes safer. And that's what the fire department is all about. Uh, we're, we're always trying to figure out how to get the word out. So this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, I am a captain with the Durham Fire Department. I've been with the fire department for 27 years and the last two and a half have been in community education. I saw Alexis on the meeting. I've gotten to work with her in a lot of different uh, avenues, and it's always great to be out in the community, even virtually. So the thing that I want to tell everybody and talk to everybody about tonight, we're going to kind of start with a picture that I sent out, and I think Brian was yep. going to share. There's yeah. a picture uh, that says shoes. So if you right. can show I'll that. Try to do that. Yep. Alexis, I, I cannot. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Go ahead, try it again. Okay. Oh, yeah, I sent this go. stuff out. I wasn't sure who was going to be yep. in control. Nope. Not a problem. Not a problem. I'll just let me um I know which one you're talking about. Just give me just a second. There's it's uh it was an attachment just that it's just mm -hmm. a still. Right. Let me so when Brian gets this up, this is a board that our uh, fire chief out in Bahama put together to use in different venues around the state. It's been to the state fair. It's been in a couple of different places. And it's just to kind of show people what the fire deaths in North Carolina look like this year. So that board right there has 81 pairs of shoes on it. I took that picture a couple of months ago. There are now 110 pairs of shoes on that board. And each pair of shoes is representative of someone who died in a house fire in North Carolina this year. So we felt like that that was a, a very impactful way because the, they tried to get the shoes to be representative of the people. Um, you can see the little tiny ones up there at the top there. We, we lost some children in these fires. The, I believe the shoes that belong to the oldest person on there, it was a gentleman who was in his early 90s. So you can see from the shoes on that board that fire can affect everyone and uh, it affects everyone across our state. One of the uh, most important things that you can do for your family, your friends, for yourself, for your own protection is to make sure that you have a working smoke alarm in your home. 47% of those shoes would not be on that board if those homes had had a smoke alarm or had had a, work, a properly working smoke alarm in their home. So that really is the major number one message that we would like for everyone to take with them this holiday season. When they're uh, in groups, when they're meeting with their families, when they're visiting uh, elderly relatives, people that might not need to be climbing up on 
ladders to change batteries. I mean, that could be the best holiday gift that you could give someone is to make sure that they have a working smoke alarm in their home. Three out of five deaths in homes uh, in-house fires are in homes that don't have a smoke alarm or don't have a properly working smoke alarm. The theme this year was to make sure you know what kind of sounds that your smoke alarm is supposed to make. So we all have experienced the battery beep on our smoke alarms, I'm sure. Most of the time, if they're going, the battery is going to go bad. It's going to be three o'clock in the morning and it's going to wake you up for absolutely no reason. So that's uh, just that little chirp sound that is very, very annoying. That's why we encourage people to get into the habit of changing your batteries regularly. A lot of our homes nowadays have smoke alarms that are wired into our electrical system, but they're still gonna have a battery backup. And that's so that if the power goes out, you're gonna be able to still have that protection from the smoke alarm. So just make sure that you get into a habit of changing your battery, whether you have the hardwired kind of smoke alarms or whether you have ones that work strictly on a battery, just make sure you change them once a year. We used to say every time that you change your clocks, but a lot of the batteries in, uh, that we are using now are a little bit more effective than some of the older ones. So you'd be in good shape if you made sure that you changed them once a year. The um, smoke alarms have a life, uh, a life expectancy. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize. They think as long as it's gonna make noise, that that means it's working effectively. It is not because those little sensors that are in our smoke alarms and our carbon monoxide alarms too, are constantly testing the air and, uh, and looking for the danger in, in your home. So they get old and they get to where they're not as effective. So you've got about a 10 year lifespan on smoke alarms and around a seven year lifespan on carbon monoxide alarms. So think about that the next time that you change your batteries and see if you can look, find that manufacture date on your smoke alarm or on your CO alarm and replace it if it's within those times. We encourage people, even if your smoke alarm goes off inadvertently and because you've burned the toast or somebody's doing a little bit of holiday cooking when they um, when they weren't paying too much attention to what's going on, use a, a kitchen rag, wave it. Don't um, take the smoke alarm down because sometimes you may forget to put it back up. And that's where the circumstances come in sometime where they had a smoke alarm in their home, but it wasn't where it, it needed to be. Uh, some of the causes of these house fires, uh, you can probably guess what the number one is, is cooking. That's, that's one of the number one causes of, of house fires is unattended cooking. It's not that they were a bad cook or that they didn't, they didn't know what they were doing with the cooking. It's just that they walked away and left their stove unattended. In some of the classes that we do and the groups that we, we meet with, we try to encourage people to never walk away while there's something on the stove, turn the stove off. But if you absolutely have to leave, take something with you from the kitchen, take a hot pad, take a wooden spoon, take a spatula, take something that when you see it in your hand, you're going to remember to go back to the kitchen and check and see what you have on the stove. Uh, I can't remember from one end of my house to the next why I left one room and went to the other. So having that item in your, in your hand is going to be a good memory jogger for you. The uh, so un, uh, improperly discarded smoking materials. I know people don't smoke as much as they used to, and a lot of people won't smoke in their homes, which is, is good, but they may go out on their deck, they may go on a porch, and they don't dispose of their smoking materials in a bucket or in a, in a pail of water or something like that. And then the next thing you know, the side of their house is on fire. We've had a couple of um, recent fires either in a garage or on a person's back porch because of improperly disposed of smoking materials. So if you do smoke or you have friends and family that smoke, especially when they're coming over for the holidays, make sure you've got a little bucket that has some sand or something like that in it. So, or a bucket with some water in it so that when they're done, they can drop their, their cigarette butts or if they're having a holiday cigar on the back deck or something, they can put it in a bucket of water or in a bucket of sand. 
The other thing that we see this time of year when people are using their fireplaces, they're using their wood stoves and that's wonderful. It's all nice and cozy. Uh, then they get ready to clean those, those wood stoves and those fireplaces out. It takes a lot longer for that ash to become completely cool than you would think. We've had people that have shoveled that ash out of their wood stove or their fireplace and put it in one of those handy dandy Amazon cardboard boxes that everybody's having piled up on their front porches now. And they set it outside. They set it on their porch. They set it on their back deck because it was, it was cool enough to shovel. And the next thing you know, it's gotten a little bit of air to it. And that cardboard box is on fire and the siding on their house is on fire or their deck is on fire. So put that ash, if you have to put it in a cardboard box, then wet it down and keep it away from the side of your house. The best thing to have is a metal bucket to scoop everything out in, even if you're two or three days away from whenever you had your last fire. Put it in a metal bucket, fill that bucket up with water and let it sit overnight. And that way you're going to make sure that when you do spread that out, that you don't set your yard on fire or you don't set your, your porch on fire. The um, Having a bunch of people come and be with us in the holidays, it's all fun, but it's also sometimes a lot of confusion. Everybody knows what a yardstick looks like. That three foot distance for the yardstick is um, just, a, it's a distance to keep in mind. That's the safe distance for keeping children and pets and anything that's combustible away from things like your stove and away from space heaters and away from fireplaces and away from wood stoves. So just kind of keep that in your mind when your house starts to fill up with all the family and friends that you have over for the holidays and make sure you can put a little distance between your, your guests and the anything that might be combustible. And Brian, if you will, if we have time, if you will show that video, that's okay. the um, legacy. One of the reasons that smoke alarms are so important nowadays is because we have legacy homes, which are our older, uh, the heavy timber, all wood construction. So we have those, anything that's probably older than 30 years old is, would be considered a legacy home. And then we have our modern homes and our modern furnishings. These pictures that you're gonna show are this, see this little Let's video that you're gonna see. It. Yep, I'll get it Maybe. in just a minute. Is, <laughs> nope. um, I saw part of it in yep. the corner, but I'm not sure where it went. Uh, drag it back. <laughs> but it shows why, go. It's gonna show why you don't have as much time now in our newer modern homes to get out safely. And that is again, another reason why these smoke alarms are so important. So you've got the natural home that's gonna be wool and cotton and wood and all linen fabrics, all kinds of natural fabrics, fabrics that's on your left. The synthetic ones are a lot of the materials that we have in our homes now, they're, they're petroleum based, they're chemical based. You can see how much darker the smoke gets in that synthetic room and how quickly it happens. So in these legacy homes years ago, when the, um, for those older homes, you had around 17 or 18 minutes to get out of those homes safely, which means that the fire department had that amount of time to get there and get a jump on the fire. Now in these modern homes with the synthetic furnishings and with the, the building materials that they're using nowadays, you've got about three. So that's a big difference. And you can see that room, the synthetic room. I, I mean, as a firefighter, that natural room, I'd still go into that room with a water can, a water extinguisher like you used to have in the school buildings. And you could put most of that fire out. You absolutely could not do that, you know, two or three minutes into the synthetic room because of that toxic smoke and because of how quickly and how hot um, the synthetic rooms and synthetic homes, uh, say that three times fast, and synthetic <laughs> homes go up. 
So that's probably the, the biggest and the most important message that we would like for people to realize. Durham Fire Department has a uh, five minute response time goal. But as you can see with the times that we have here and with the time that you saw those rooms on fire, even if we get there, we're right next door to you practically and we get there in less than five minutes, uh, there can still be a lot of damage done and, and we can still have people that we have to come in and save just because of how, how black the smoke gets and how toxic, toxic it is. So those are just a few things that we would like for people to, to take with them and to remember and to have really, really safe holidays and wonderful, happy gatherings with your family and your friends and share a little bit of this information. Everybody can, um, can give the gift of, of having people be a little bit safer in their homes and with their families for the holidays. I totally agree, um, Elaine. And I just wanna again, thank you for, you know, such timely information. The holiday season is, people can forget. I didn't, re I, because I'm not a smoker. I didn't, I'm just thinking, when you do have people over, maybe you should just get a can of sand anyway, because you don't know can of sand. who's walking out your house. Smoking. Exactly. Exactly. Good and, Lord. You know, people, people, smokers are, are polite. They don't want to smoke in somebody's home, but they may go out on the porch or they may go out on the deck. And um, it, if you if you know you're having smokers come over, then you can make sure you've got those buckets of sand or those buckets of water or something like that. It's better than, than being stubbed out on your deck or even if they just, they, they fell off of the arm of the chair or something like that. It, it's just a, it's just a nice small and make sure it's a, it's a metal bucket. We don't want to be doing this with a plastic bucket or something like that, but you, you'd probably still be okay. But a little metal bucket with some sand in it and, They'll think you're the best hostess in the world. I think so. Well, thank you once again. We're going to definitely have you back. Well, I'll tell you what, um, it's just been, you know, just such an eye-opening experience. And just I'm just so happy that we had, you know, all our presenters um, to share with District 2 and just go out and let our neighbors know and all the people that we know up here that, you know, this is, this is the place to be if you really want to find out what's going on and we need more people to get involved so we're excited about that so I want to thank you and I'm just going to pass it back to Brian all right thank you um Elaine uh Colleen did have a question she asked does the fire department still come to your home and replace smoke detectors if needed or did that go away with COVID or low staffing um, no, we do that. The, we partner with the Red Cross and with the um, Department of Insurance Office, the State Fire Marshal's Office, and they, they um, donate smoke alarms to us to be able to go and put in people's homes that need them. And we are still doing hmm. that. Um, we have been up and down as far as the COVID cases as to whether our, our firefighters can come and do it or whether my partner and I try to, um, to come and take care of it ourselves. When uh, the COVID cases are high, then we try to protect our firefighters and keep them from going into people's homes unnecessarily. Uh, they're in and out of sick people's homes when they have to be on calls, but we do try to, to keep them out of people's homes. So uh, my partner Antoine and I can, can take care of that. You can go to durhamfd.org and uh, it will show you some of the things that, um, that, you know, there's just information in there about the fire department and, yeah. ha and a, no, having a smoke alarm or a CO alarm for that matter is uh, one of those options. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, um, and Rebecca and I, again, thank you so much for all of our presenters. We thank you for coming this evening and uh, participating. A lot, of, a lot of good questions and uh, we appreciate those. Um, so I'll just end by wishing you a happy holidays, Merry Christmas, um, try to enjoy time with your families. I uh, specifically wanna thank uh, all of our uh, police officers, fire, uh, EMTs, because uh, your seven 
<laughs> you're 724 365. So we appreciate you guys still being um, available even during the holidays. Ho hopefully everyone will get an opportunity to spend time with their families. Have a great evening and we'll um, talk to you guys uh, in January. Bye-bye.